circular reasoning is a type of logical fallacy. And a logical fallacy is basically a failure of reasoning. So it's important as a reader to recognize logical fallacies because they diminish the value of the author's message. So since circular reasoning is a type of logical fallacy, we could also call circular reasoning a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we can define it as reasoning that offers no support for assertions other than restating them in different words. So another way to define this is we could say circular arguments refer to themselves as evidence of truth. So if you find, some, find an argument that refers to itself as evidence of truth, then you know it's a circular argument. Now, circular reasoning is one of the more difficult logical fallacies to identify because it is typically hidden behind dense language and complicated sentences. Now, a simple example of circular argument is when a person uses a word to define itself. Like right here where it says niceness is the state of being nice. So if you as the reader do not know what the word nice means, then this sentence won't be of very much help to you. Now, Right here we have a little bit of a more complicated example and this is what you are more likely to find in your reading. It says poverty is a problem for society because it creates trouble for people throughout the community. So it is redundant to say that poverty is a problem because it creates trouble. So when an author engages in circular reasoning like this right here, it is either because he or she has not fully thought out the argument or because they cannot come up with any legitimate justifications. An essay where you are asked to compare and contrast is extremely prevalent and very popular, so you're probably going to be asked to write one of these types of essays at some point, so it's important that you are prepared to do that. So look at this example, running and swimming as forms of exercise. So in this example, you'd be asking to compare and, co and contrast running and swimming. So look at running and swimming and talk about how they are alike. That's the compare part of it. And the contrast part is talking about how running and swimming are different. But remember, you're not just talking about running and swimming. You're talking about them as forms of exercise. So think about how running and swimming are similar in terms of exercise and how they are different forms of exercise as well. So there are a few things to remember when writing one of these essays. First, have purpose. Don't just compare and contrast something just to do it. Have some kind of purpose, like that way your reader can determine which is the best form, or sometimes it's to show your reader which is the best choice. Then pick your style. Sometimes you can go back and forth, like you can talk about how running and swimming are alike in this way and then talk about how they're alike in this way. Or you can just talk about running, keep talking about running, and then talk about swimming. So the choice is talk about running and then swimming or talk about running and swimming back and forth throughout the entire essay. The choice is yours, just decide which one is most effective. And then finally, derive purpose. Now I know I just put that up there, but it's very important. Don't just write an essay where the reader comes to the end of it wondering why they even read your essay. Give them some kind of purpose to comparing and contrasting the things that you have been talking about through the entire paper. So remember those things and you'll be on your way to writing a great essay. Conflict. Conflict is a central element of plot in any piece of literature. And it is going to be the struggle or problem around which the plot centers. So whenever you're thinking about conflict, think about problem. What is the problem in the story? What is it that they're trying to figure out a solution to? What is it that everyone's worried about? That's going to be your main problem or your conflict. Now when you're deciding what the conflict is, there are generally two basic types. You have external conflict, And external conflict is just what it sounds like. When the main character 
has a struggle with another force. It's external. So when the main character has a struggle with another force, the conflict is external. Um, an example with, of another force would be another character or a force of nature. So having a problem with another character is pretty self-explanatory. They have some problem with another character. They think the character is doing something wrong and want to fix it. They are mad at another character. They are in love with another character. That's going to be having a conflict or a problem with that other character that needs to be resolved, and that would be an external conflict. Or it could be with a force of nature. Forces of nature are external. They are outside of the main character, and so that makes it an external conflict. An example of a force of nature being the main conflict source would be if there was a bad storm coming. That storm is a force of nature, and it could be the conflict. Or if a man is trapped on an island, that would be a conflict because they're trapped there. All of nature is keeping them there. They can't get away. Um, and the struggle to survive could be another conflict with nature. The other basic type of conflict would be an internal conflict. So we had external where the problem was outside. So internal conflict is when... A character has a problem when the main character has a problem that they're struggling with internally. So when the main character has a struggle within him or herself. So it isn't anything outside, it isn't, it isn't anything other people are affecting. So they could influence it with their actions, but the problem is really going to reside within that person. An example of that would be deciding between right and wrong. Other people can tell you this is right, this is wrong. One person may say it's all right to steal a loaf of bread if you're hungry and you have no money. Someone else may tell you it's wrong to do that because it's still stealing. So it's an internal conflict within that character when they have to decide for themselves if something is right or wrong. So whenever you're looking at conflict, whenever you're trying to find what that conflict is in a story, look at what the main problem is. And to delve deeper and better understand the conflict, ask yourself if it's an external conflict or an internal conflict. Remembering that external is going to be when a character is struggling with another force, something outside of him or herself, another character or a force of nature. And an internal character is going to be when the main character has a problem within him or herself where they have to decide something only on, based on what's inside, not any external force. Good example, deciding between right and wrong. The most important thing to remember is what conflict is. So just keep saying to yourself, a conflict is a problem. A conflict is a problem. And that should help you be able to figure out what the conflict is in any story. Figurative language. Figurative language is language that goes beyond the literal meaning of a word. And authors will use figurative language to enhance their writing. Some common examples of figurative language are hyperbole, simile, metaphor, and personification. So we'll discuss each of those and I'll give you some examples for each. Hyperbole is exaggeration. People will say something and you aren't meant to take it literally. You're meant to know it's an exaggeration, but it's there just to emphasize how strongly the author is trying to convey something. For instance, I've told you a million times. I bet some of you have probably heard that one. And a million times, really? Probably you haven't heard whatever your parent or teacher has said they've told you a million times. It's an exaggeration. It's hyperbole. It's meant to emphasize that they've already told you this a lot more times before now. Another example would be, I had a ton of homework. You did not literally go home with 2,000 pounds of homework, 
but you're telling people I had a lot of homework. It was way more than the normal amount. It was a ton. It was that much homework. So that's what hyperbole is, exaggeration. Next we've got simile, which is comparing two things using like or as. And this is very important. You have to use those words like or as or it's not going to be a simile anymore. So, the child howled like a coyote. We see our word like. You're comparing two things in this sentence. The child howled like a coyote compares the child to a coyote using the word like. This example is letting you know that the child is loud. It's crying sounds like a howl, much like a coyote. So this figurative language is used to bring a coyote to mind to help you picture and hear in your mind how this child is screaming or crying. Next, let's look at this example. She ran as fast as lightning. Well, that's going to compare two things here, and we see the word as. So what is being compared in this sentence? She ran as fast as lightning. And usually when you have one as, you've got two. So, it's comparing she, or a girl, to lightning. And that is being done by using the word as. So when you're comparing a girl to lightning, you're saying she's that fast. It went so fast you barely got to see her before she got past you or got to the finish line. So it's just letting you know she's really, really fast. So that's what simile is, comparing two things using like or as. And again, these are the important words to look for to make it actually be a simile. It could be a metaphor, which compares two things without using like or as. And that is really the big difference between a simile and a metaphor. A simile uses like or as. A metaphor does not use like or as. So let's look at some metaphor examples. She was lightning running down the track. So this sentence is very similar to this one. They're both comparing she or a girl to lightning. They're both saying this girl is really fast, but this one just says she was lightning. She was lightning running down the track. It doesn't say she ran as fast as lightning. It doesn't use like or as, it just says she was lightning. So it's a different way to use the same kind of figurative language. So that's one example of a metaphor. Let's look at this. And this is an excerpt from Edgar Allan Poe's poem, The Raven. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. Now this one's a little trickier. Because it doesn't just come out and say, this was this, or this is this. Like here it said, she was lightning. But it says that his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming. So we're comparing his eyes to a demon's eyes, which is basically comparing him or a man to a demon. If his eyes are like a demon's eyes, then this man is being compared to a demon, which is to maybe say that the man is evil. It doesn't mean he's literally a demon. It means he's got some characteristic of a demon. He's maybe an evil person. So in poetry, your figurative language may not always pop out at you if it's a metaphor. A simile is pretty easy to spot because you'll see like or as. But a metaphor might be a little trickier. So just look for what two things are being compared in that sentence or that phrase of a poem. And the last piece of figurative language we're going to discuss is personification which is when an inanimate object is given human qualities. You are personifying it. You are making it 
do something a person would do even though it's not something that can do these things. And remember, inanimate objects are going to be things that are not alive. A chair, a teapot, the wind, water, those are inanimate objects. So the example here, the water slapped the side of the boat. The water slapped. Can water actually slap like a person would slap? No, but it makes you think of the action of slapping and the sound you might hear with the slap whenever you picture this water slapping the side of the boat. And that's why they're using this particular word and personifying the water. Depending on what the story is about where this sentence appears, it could be that the water is being made as like a, an evil character. If someone drowns in this story, then the water would be seen as an enemy. And so it slapping the side of the boat would give it that negative feeling. Another example, the teapot shrieked. Shrieking, screaming, that loud sound, you can hear it in your head when you think about the noise a teapot makes. But a teapot isn't actually shrieking like a person would. It's simply making that noise because the air is hot enough that it's trying to get out now. Or the wind howled. Wind can't howl like a wolf would howl. But wind makes that same kind of sound sometimes, and so the author is trying to put that sound of howling in your mind when they're describing the wind. So figurative language can be a lot of different things. Hyperbole, where you're exaggerating. Simile, where you're comparing two things using like or as. Very important markers for a simile. Metaphor, where you're comparing two things without using like or as. And personification when an object is given human qualities, whenever it's personified. And all of these techniques are used so that the words will go beyond the literal meaning of them and give you a deeper understanding of the poem or the work that you're reading. The author is trying to go beyond the words and make you really think about their meaning and put certain connotations in your head whenever you're reading. Historical context. Historical context can impact literature in a number of ways. The author's writing can be impacted by the historical period during which it was written or the historical setting of the story. For instance, when Charles Dickens was writing, he was writing during a period where authors were paid by the word, which meant that his novels were very, very long. And that was the result of the time period during which his work was written. He was writing long novels because he knew he would get paid more for every word that he wrote. Dialect is something else you can pay attention to. The dialect could be what the author is used to using in his everyday life, or the dialect could be more related to the historical setting of the story. So dialect is something you want to pay attention to and ask yourself, is this the dialect used during the setting or is this more of just the author using his own personal dialect that he's used to? Another thing to pay attention to with historical setting is major events that are going on. You want to be familiar with the time period during which a story is set so you can have a better understanding of it. So um, one example is the Civil War. During the Civil War, slavery was the normal thing in the South. And whenever the Civil War is over, lots of slaves or people that used to be slaves wanted to tell their story. And so what came about were slave narratives. And these painted a picture of what slave life, slave life was actually like during that time. It was a, an actual account from that time period. And it, it kind of also told the relationship between slaves and slaveholders. So that source of writing is very valuable and it's become one of the most important literary genres for African American writers. Today, people may still write from that perspective in that time period, but the actual slave narratives that gave firsthand accounts were very important. Another thing to pay attention to with Civil War writing, slave narratives, um, anything from that time period are the themes. A lot of times you'll see themes of power, race, inequality. 
Because when slavery ended, it was because people were saying, your skin color doesn't make you more or less of a person or a better or worse person. Everyone's equal. And while equal rights didn't come about till later, it started that theme of equality around the Civil War time. Another major event that's common is World War II. There are countless novels based around World War II events, whether it's based in Nazi Germany, whether it's based in America, um, as people are dealing with what was going on here. But one of the biggest things that you'll see is the topic of genocide, destroying a whole race. Um, so your Jewish Nazi relations, you're going to see a lot of. Um, Anne Frank, very, very popular book, one that most people are going to know about, was based on this. And if you know the World War II era, then you know what to expect when you're reading. You know that the Nazis are trying to take over most of Europe. You know that the Jews are being persecuted. And you've already got that bit of background knowledge before you even read the rest of the book. And with World War II novels, you're again going to see themes of race, power, and democracy. Because in the end, people were going to say that having a government where some totalitarian dictator took over everything wasn't the best way to be. And you're going to see people highlighting the pros of democracy. So whenever you're reading, really pay attention to the historical context of the story because the historical period during which it was written is always going to have an impact and the historical setting is going to be very important for you to understand so that you can understand why the author gave the character certain motivations and why the author carried out the plot as they did. Inference. Inferences are conclusions that a reader makes using clues in the text. So an author may not explicitly say something, but they leave little hints behind, and you have to connect the dots to form a conclusion. And inference is different than making a guess because it is based on evidence. So you read you pick up on those clues or hints that the author leaves behind and you put them all together to form your inference. So let's look at a couple of examples. Charlotte's toddler is in bed asleep upstairs. She hears a loud thump and then loud crying. So knowing that the toddler is in bed asleep and then hearing a thump and crying, you can infer, or Charlotte can infer when she's at home, that her toddler fell out of bed. Now, our example doesn't say the toddler fell out of bed, and it doesn't say Charlotte ran upstairs and found her child on the floor, but because you know the kid was in a, in a bed sleeping, and then you hear a thump, probably against the floor, and then crying, because the kid is hurt or scared from waking up in the middle of the night on the floor unexpectedly, Charlotte can infer that her toddler fell out of bed. Or the reader can infer that that's what, happening, what happened whenever they're trying to process the story and figure out what the author was trying to tell them with these clues. So let's look at another example. Nolan sees cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth. So cookie crumbs on the floor, chocolate around his mouth, is going to tell you that Nolan's son got into the cookie jar. And it may not be the cookie jar, it may be that he got into a pack of cookies, but you don't really know the rest of that. You just know that if there are cookie crumbs on the floor and chocolate around his son's mouth, that the kid got into cookies somehow. So you can infer he got into a cookie jar or a pack of cookies without knowing, without the author explicitly saying that to you. And that's all it is. That's all inferences. Reading something and coming to a conclusion. 
a lot of the times it's really obvious things. If you see a lady come into a store and she's dripping wet and it's raining outside, you can infer that she doesn't have an umbrella. So some things are just common sense. They come to you. You don't even realize you're making an inference. But in the end, an, it, an inference is just a conclusion that a reader makes based on evidence. Let's talk about literary genres. A genre is basically a category. So take music, for example. There are many different types of musical genres, such as rock, classical, pop, and country. So a musical genre is basically just a category of music. In the same way, a literary genre is basically a category of literature. It's when you take similar works of literature and group them together in different categories. It's also important to remember that the criteria for genres is always changing. Literary experts have differing views on which genres should exist and the criteria for those genres. So it's hard for me just to write up here on the board all the literary genres that exist because it's not cut and dry. Different literary experts have different views on which ones exist. Then when you start looking at the literary genres, it can get confusing from there because then you have sub-genres that come from those literary genres. Take, for example, the two simplest uh, genres, nonfiction and fiction. Nonfiction being a true story and fiction being a made-up story. Sometimes, sometimes authors will combine those two genres by writing about a true story but changing the names of the characters. So then it's both a nonfiction story and a fiction story, creating a third genre. So take a look at some other genres out there. Take nonfiction, for example. You have the genre of nonfiction, but then you can split that up into the subgenres of essay, memoir, and then there's others as well. Or if you look at the Greek classification system of genres, you have poetry, drama, and prose. But poetry can be divided up into the subgenres sub of lyric and epic, and drama can be split up into the subgenres of comedy and tragedy. Comedy being a uh, drama with a good ending, and a tragedy being a drama with a bad ending. But then the subgenre of comedy can be split up into more subgenres, such as a comedy of manners and a sentimental comedy. So you can see how confusing the classif classification system can get. But don't be overwhelmed by that. The main thing you need to remember is that a literary genre is a category of literature. Organizational methods to structure text. Authors organize their writing based on the purpose of their text. And five of the main methods that authors use to structure their text, text are cause and effect, compare and contrast, chronological order, inductive presentation of ideas, and deductive presentation ideas. Cause and effect presents the reasons something happened. For instance, if I said, if you go to bed late, you will be tired. The cause is going to bed late, and the effect is being tired. And a cause and effect uh, piece of writing is going to keep giving you reason something happened and the effect of that particular reason. Compare and contrast writing discusses similarities and differences. It's going to say how two things are alike and how they are different. And these may also come across as pro and con pieces where it gives you the pros of two things and the cons of two things. An example would be if I said as a thesis statement, those who are up to date on technology are still debating over whether DVDs or Blu-ray discs are better. Well, the author could go through and describe all the similarities between DVDs and Blu-ray discs and all the differences between DVDs and Blu-ray discs. So, in the end, you could make up your mind which one is better because they're simply comparing and contrasting the two. Chronological order presents information in the order that it happened. It starts at the beginning and works its way to the end. And a good example of chronological order pieces are biographies. You start whenever someone was born, you go through their childhood, adulthood, and events leading up to their death. It happens, the book is laid out to describe events exactly in the order that they happened chronologically in time. Inductive presentation of ideas starts with specific examples and moves to 
a general conclusion. So if I were to want to convince you that it was good to donate blood, I would start off with lots of specific examples or reasons why it was good to donate blood and then give you the general conclusion, you should always donate blood. Deductive presentation of ideas is going to be the opposite of that. It starts with a conclusion, you should always donate blood. And then it explains supporting examples. So I would give you examples or reasons um, that list out the benefits of donating blood. And you can see these two are opposite, so it's important to remember the difference. Inductive is going to list all of them and then take them in in a general conclusion at the end. Deductive is kind of maybe think division. You start with one big conclusion and divide it down into lots of supporting details or examples. So whenever you are trying to organize your own writing or trying to figure out the purpose of an author's writing, try to figure out what the organizational method was and it might help you figure out the overall purpose of the text. Persuasive essays. When writing a persuasive essay, the writer will try to convince the reader to adopt the opinion of the writer on a particular issue. They do this in many different ways, but they should demonstrate a keen understanding of their audience. You need to know who you're writing to, who you're trying to convince of this opinion. Consider the interests, prior knowledge, and learning styles of the audience. So think about who you're writing to. Are they going to be interested in this topic to start with or are you going to have to get them interested? Are they going to have any prior knowledge about this or is this the first time they're going to be reading about it? How do they learn? What's the best way that you could support your thesis so that they would eventually adopt your opinion? These are all things to think about when you're writing. At the beginning of every essay, you're going to want to develop your thesis. Now the thesis is going to be in the introduction of your persuasive, persuasive essay, but it's going to be at the end, not at the beginning. So in most papers, your thesis will be at the beginning of that introductory paragraph, but not in a persuasive essay. Because in a persuasive essay, you want to establish credibility first. You want to win the trust of the audience or at least their interest before you tell them what you're trying to convince them of. And one way to do this is to use an anecdote or story. If you start off your paper with a short anecdote or story, it kind of warms the audience to you. You may give them a little bit more information that lets them know you are a credible source to be talking about this topic and then introduce your thesis then introduce what it is you're going to be trying to convince them of in this persuasive essay. Now once you've established your thesis, there are several ways that you can develop it, but we're going to discuss three different persuasive essay techniques today. One is making claims. You're going to give lots of supporting ideas to your main argument, so you should have small claims along, along the way that support the central argument. You make one big claim at the beginning when you tell people what it is you're writing about, what it is you're trying to convince them of, but you're going to make several small claims along the way that support that central argument. Claims should be rooted in fact and observation. These claims cannot be something that is just your opinion. It can't be something you made up. You can't say, I think chocolate ice cream is the best ice cream. You could say, I think a, an ice cream parlor should serve more varieties of chocolate ice cream. And you could back that up by going and doing some research, looking to see what kind of money the store might make if they had different ice cream flavors. And you could back it up. There's facts, there's observations. There's statistics you could look at, but if you just say chocolate's the best, there should be more chocolate, that's just your opinion. It's not a small claim that would be confirmable. 
And that leads us to this part. Must be confirmed. Any facts that you include, any observations must be confirmable. You must be able to go back and show where you found them, show that it's a true statement. So, with any persuasive essay, include references when possible. Show where you got this information. Don't make the reader go find it. Present it to them to show that you are being upfront about this, what you're saying is true, what you're saying is the right thing, and they should believe you. It further establishes trust with them. Another way that you can develop your thesis is with examples and expert opinions. Examples are most effective when they complement facts. So you've laid out some facts and observations. Now I'll give some examples that support those because examples are a good way to make dry facts more interesting or understandable. Sometimes a writer will present a fact and you'll say, mm, I don't really know what they mean by that. But if they give you an example to back it up, then you say, oh, that's what they meant. So using an example can make your audience understand what you're trying to tell them better and make it more interesting because sometimes facts are dry and hearing a lot of facts in a row may just be boring and may not actually pull your reader's interest toward that opinion you're trying to convince them of. If you use an expert opinion, they, your expert should have a title or credential of some sort that clearly indicates the expert's knowledge and experience in the topic. So, if you're saying someone is an expert on, let's say, a certain drug, then you may want the doctor to be there to say, oh, well, amoxicillin really does have all these health benefits, and here are all the things that I can tell you about that. You want a doctor. You want him to be able to show he's got a degree in medicine. You don't want it to be just someone that comes on and says, oh yeah, I've given my kid a moxil several times and my kid always gets better after a cold. That's not what you want. You want someone who's got verifiable credentials to be an expert. Now, we've looked at making claims, using facts to support your thesis, and using examples and expert opinions to back those up, but you can also look at emotional appeals. Opinions are formed by emotion as well as reason. So these are going to play more on reason, more on logic, where emotional appeals are going to pull on a reader's emotions. These should be used in a proper and ethical manner. And that's important to remember. If you're going to appeal to a reader's emotions, you need to be responsible about it and make sure you're doing it the right way. And let me show you some examples to expand on that. Think about drunk driving ads. Sometimes you may see some really sad and graphic things in those ads, but what's being shown is shown to you to let you know that this is a serious issue, that people should not drive after drinking because there can be terrible consequences. Anyone using that information should be using it to support not drinking and driving. And so even though it's pulling on your emotions, it's doing it for a good reason. But then let's look at politics. A lot of times, one candidate will put out an ad saying how patriotic they are, showing how they've served their country and all the ways they're patriotic. And that's really nice, but often it's going to also imply that the other candidate competing against the first one is not very patriotic. And that's usually far from the truth. Meanwhile, that first candidate's patriotism is going to link them to voters. Voters are going to say, oh, I really care about the country too, so I need to go with this guy because he's patriotic and the other one isn't, even though that's not true. So you don't want to mislead your audience with emotional appeals. And one other way that that can be done is with loaded language. If someone is extremely religious and they are called a fanatic, the word fanatic has a certain connotation to it that is negative. The same way if someone was environmentally conscious and someone called him a tree hugger, that has a negative connotation. So using loaded language words like that can give negative connotations and pull on a reader's emotions that way. And that's not what you want to do. You want to use it to support your argument, but not put down other things. So whenever you're writing a persuasive essay, make sure you're keeping in mind who your audience is, 
what their interests are, how much they may already know about the topic, and what's going to help them the most. And then you can decide if you want to use small claims along the way, expert opinions and examples, or emotional appeals to back up your thesis. But the most important thing you're going to need to do is to win your audience's trust. You want to establish that you're credible so that you can convince them that your opinion is the correct one. Plotline. Every plotline basically follows the same stages. Introduction or exposition, the rising action, conflict, climax, falling action or denouement, resolution or conclusion. In the introduction, it's going to set up the plot and tell you what the story is about. It's at the very beginning and it's just there to kind of get everything set up. And on this diagram that can represent plot, you might call this a plot diagram. Your introduction would be here. Your rising action is everything leading up to the conflict. All the action leading up to your conflict. So everything that happens before you find out what your conflict is, is going to be rising action. And you can see how it rises up the slope of this plot diagram. Now your conflict is going to be your main problem. Now, there may be lots of problems in this particular story. So the main problem is what your conflict is going to be. And that's located further up on the diagram. So you've got your introduction where everything gets set up. Rising action leading up to your conflict or problem. That's the point in the plot where you find out what the main problem is going to be. The climax is going to be that very important part where the conflict kind of comes to a head. All the trouble comes to a head. It's the peak of the conflict. If there were people that didn't know about this problem. The climax is when everyone finally finds out. So the climax is up here at the top. It's when all that action that's been building up and rising finally comes to a head. It comes to the top. And after that, your story starts resolving itself. So with your falling action, it's going to be what comes after the conflict. the beginning of a resolution. So things start to resolve themselves. We've got our falling action and it's going to fall the same way our rising action began. So the author may be tying up any loose ends, kind of getting you ready for the end of the story with your falling action. And then we've got the resolution or conclusion. And this is where you might find, you will probably find, because sometimes the author leaves you wondering, but you will probably find a solution to your conflict. So whatever that main problem was, your resolution is usually going to contain your solution to that. And that's going to be over here at the bottom. your resolution or conclusion. So whenever you're going through a story, it's usually going to follow these main stages. You're going to start with the introduction where all of your plot information is set up. You kind of know what your story is about. You've got rising action. You've got characters interacting. You've got the plot building. And then you get to the conflict. You get to a problem. And after that, it's about how the characters are going to solve the problem. And you get to the climax where Everyone now knows about the problem. It's the very peak of the conflict. And after that, you've got your falling action. Everyone is kind of wrapping things up. They're fixing the problem however they decided to fix it after the climax. 
and then in the resolution you find out what that solution is most of the time and any loose ends are wrapped up finally in that resolution. Sometimes you do will have an author who leaves some questions hanging. A lot of times if there's a cliffhanger ending to a book and you know there's going to be a sequel or the same with the movie, then the plot line might not give you a solution because they're going to give you another book later on that hopefully has a solution in it. So whenever you're looking at any literary work, look for a plot line in it to help you understand what's happening. If you can understand your plot, you're going to be able to understand everything else in the story a lot better. Point of view. The point of view is the perspective from which a story is told. And the narrator is the person who tells the story. So when we're looking for point of view, we're looking to see if we have a first person narrator or a third person narrator that's telling us this story. In first person, your narrator is going to be your main character. And they're going to be saying, I, me, we, these are the pronouns you're going to see associated with the first person narrator. If it's the main character, you're only going to get to know what the main character knows. You're only going to get to read about what that main character does or what he does with someone else. But you won't know about anything that doesn't happen involving the main character because this is written from a first person point of view and you're only going to hear from this viewpoint. Third person is the most common point of view. And you're going to see pronouns like he, she, and they. The narrator is going to talk about other characters, but the narrator is not one of the characters. And third person omniscient is very common as well. Omniscient means all knowing. So a third person omniscient narrator is going to be one who describes all other characters. So, at once. So this narrator is going to be able to tell you what every other character in the story is thinking, what every other character in the story is doing. Now they may not actually do it all in the same passage. Sometimes they split it into chapters. So one chapter is written to where the author is telling you everything that Johnny does. One chapter is split to tell you everything that Susie does. So. You find out everyone's point of view, but possibly at different times. But the author is able to do all that without actually being a part of the story. So, whenever you're looking for who your narrator is, the pronouns are the important thing to look at. Let's look at this passage. John walked to school every day. He and his friends were often cold and tired by the time they arrived. They were allowed to warm up by the stove before sitting in their seats. In this passage, let's look at the pronouns to help determine the point of view. And your pronouns are going to be words that take the place of nouns, such as I, me, we, he, she, they, it, you. But these are going to be the ones that are really going to set you off as markers to let you know if it's a first person or third person narrator that you're listening to. So looking through this, we have he and his friends by the time they arrived. They were allowed to warm up by the stove before sitting in their seats. And it started with John. So the narrator is using he and they and someone's name. Now, first person could use someone's name, and that's why it's important to look at the pronouns. But the narrator starts talking about John, and then he uses all of these third person pronouns. The narrator is a third person narrator here. Oh, uh, let's write it out. Third person. And you know this because you're looking at the pronouns. And the pronouns are all telling you that the narrator is telling you what's happening, but the narrator is not a part of the action. So the point of view is a third person point of view. So whenever you're going to find point of view, you want to know this because the perspective of the story, 
who it's coming from is important. If it's coming from a certain character or if it's coming from a first person or a third person point of view, then you're going to have a different plot or have information, um, more intimate intima information in first person and a greater variety of information with third person. So it's always important to determine your point of view whenever you are reading a story. So just keep in mind that the best way to find that is by looking at the pronouns. I, me, and we, he, she, and they. Quotation marks are used to show that the words inside the quotation marks are someone else's, not the writer's own. So look at this sentence, come over here, Joe said. So the quotation marks right here and right here are conveying that the writer did not say come over here. Joe said come over here. So notice a few things about a sentence that um, has a quote in it. First, you open up the sentence with quotation marks. Then you capitalize the first letter of the first word inside the quotation marks. And then if you have a sentence that um, is declarative or imperative, any sentence that would end with a period if it was on its own, you end that sentence with a comma, then you have quotation marks, and then you say the rest of the sentence. So this sentence says, where did he go? Notice we open up with quotation marks, capitalize the W, but if where did he go stood by itself, it would have a question mark because it's a question. So we put a question mark right here and then close with the quotation marks. Notice that the question mark is included inside the quotation marks. It's not on the outside, it's on the inside. This sentence says, there he is, he exclaimed. So in this case, the person saying it with a lot of emotion, so that's why we ended with an exclamation mark. Now these next couple sentences are kind of inverted from the sentences we've been looking at because the quote comes later in the sentence. So this sentence says, Michael said, I can't wait for dinner. So you put a comma after said, open up with quotation marks, you go through the sentence, and then this sentence right here is declarative, so it ends with a period. And up here we ended with a comma, but here we're ending with a period because we've come to the end of the sentence and there needs to be some kind of period or question mark or exclamation mark to end out the sentence. So in this case, a period is chosen to end the sentence and then quotation marks are put at the end. Notice that the period is inside the quotation marks. This sentence says, Michael asked, what's for dinner? In this case, it's a question, so that's why we have a question mark at the end. Again, notice that it's inside the quotation marks. Now, this final sentence is kind of unique. It says, I think we are having burgers, Michael said. Do you know what we are having? So right here, there's two quotes within one sentence. So it says, I think we are having burgers. So we open up with quotation marks. We have the quote right here. We end with a comma um, because this is a, this is a declarative sentence. And then we have... Uh, another set of quotation marks. Then we have something outside of the quotes because we're saying that Michael said this. And then we continue on with what Michael said. So we open up with quotation marks that says, do you know what we are having? This is a question. So we use a question mark. And then we end with quotation marks. So those are the important things you need to remember when using quotation marks. Fiction is often read for leisure or because it is assigned. In either case, I have written some points up here on the board for you better to understand the fiction that you read. First of all, look for the point of view. There are three types of point of view, first person, second person, and third person. In a first person point of view, the narrator takes part in the story and refers to himself as I. In a second person point of view, the narrator again is involved in the story but refers to another character using the pronoun you. In a third person point of view, the author refers to the other characters as he and she. So the narrator is not actually involved in the story. They're just merely relating the story to the reader. Another part of point of view is how much the narrator knows. Sometimes you have an omniscient narrator who knows the thoughts of many of the characters. Sometimes the narrator only has limited knowledge and knows the thoughts of only one or two characters. And sometimes the narrator does not know the thoughts of any of the characters. Also look for setting. Look for when the story is taking place and where it is taking place, and that will help you better understand the work of fiction. Also, look for characters. Characters are very important in a story. They're basically what make up the story. In a story, you usually have the protagonist and the antagonist. The protagonist is generally the main character, 
and the antagonist is the one who opposes the protagonist. So look for that relationship between the protagonist and the antagonist. Figure out who those two characters are. Because the relationship between the protagonist and the antagonist is what drives the plot and develops the story. Also, look for the other characters in the story and decide which ones are important. Some play a minor role in the story and some play a larger role. So make sure you understand who the characters are, their relationship to the other characters, and what role they play in the story. And that will help you better understand the work of fiction along with following these other points that I have given you. A subject along with a verb completes a sentence. Every, su every sentence must have a subject and a verb. So always be looking for the subject in a sentence because it has to be there somewhere. Look at this first example. Running is good for you. The verb right here is is. is. So then what is the subject of this sentence? Well, the way you can find the subject is it's the person or thing that's doing the action in the sentence. So what is in this sentence? Running is. So running would be the subject. OK, so think of another example. Like um, he rode his bike. OK. Road is the verb here. So again, you can just ask the question, uh, who is riding here? Uh, who is the person or the thing doing the action here? Well, the action is riding, so then who is riding? He is riding, so he would be the subject. Over here, she is cheerful. Okay, who is cheerful? She is cheerful, so she would be the subject. Now, this is going to get a little bit more complicated now. She is cheerful, but her friend looks sad. So right here you see a verb, and then, okay, who is cheerful? She is cheerful. She is the one doing the action of the sentence, and that's being cheerful. So she is the subject. Now you look down here, and you see another verb, looks. So what's the subject over here? Can there be two subjects in a sentence? There can. Because notice right here, but. But is what we call a conjunction, because it joins two clauses together. So we have a sentence here and a sentence here, and but is joining them together to make them one. But if we have a sentence here and a sentence here being joined together by but, that means we must have two subjects and two verbs. So we found one subject and one verb, and then we found the other verb, so we're still looking for a subject. So what could the subject be? Could it be her looks sad? That wouldn't make sense, because remember, the subject is who or what is doing the action. So someone is looking sad in this sentence. Who is looking sad? The friend is looking sad, so friend is the subject over here. All right, like I said, every sentence has a subject and a verb, but you may come across some sentences like this. This sentence says, go to your room. So the verb here is go. So where is the subject in this sentence? Well, the subject is what we call an understood you. So we're going to put you in parentheses right there. So I say it's an understood you. Basically, it's understood that you is the subject of this sentence, so it doesn't even need to be included. So we could actually read the sentence as, you go to your room. But we don't always speak like that. Sometimes we leave the you out of the sentence, so we just have a verb. But nevertheless, there still is a subject. It's just not included in the sentence. Textual evidence for predictions. A prediction is an educated guess about what will come later in a text. Now, your predictions can be about an event or about how a character will behave. But any prediction you make must be based on information in the text or based on knowledge about literature in general. For instance, if you've seen how a character has acted in a story so far, you can make a prediction about his future actions. And 
with your knowledge about literature, you know the basic layout of a mystery novel. So you might be able to predict who did something in a story or how the story is going to end up based on your general knowledge of literature. And the more you read, the more your general knowledge about literature is going to increase. So you may be able to make more predictions the more you read. Now one specific way that you might find textual support for prediction is with foreshadowing. And foreshadowing is when the author hints at something that will occur later in the plot. So sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes the author doesn't say exactly what will happen. It may mention storm clouds on the horizon and the storm clouds could equal danger or something bad happening. So if you have a character who is going through a tough time and then they see storm clouds on the horizon or someone mentions, in, mentions a storm might be coming, then that may be the author's way of hinting that something bad is coming or danger is approaching. However, sometimes foreshadowing could be more direct, as in Romeo and Juliet. They talk about how they would rather die than live without one another. And that was William Shakespeare's way of hinting that in the end, when they thought that they might live without one another, they did end up killing themselves rather than live without the other one. Sometimes foreshadowing comes in the form of a fortune teller. There are a lot of stories that include a fortune teller or someone that happens to tell the fortune tell someone's fortune or tell their future even without being labeled a fortune teller. And they'll say exactly what's going to happen and then later on that's how the plot unfolds. Now sometimes the author will throw in what's called a red herring. And that's when they tell you what's going to happen but it doesn't really happen. So when a hint or prediction by the author does not actually happen. So, you have to pay attention because sometimes the author may give you a direct foreshadowing example. They may go and say exactly what's going to happen and that'll be true. But sometimes they'll give a really big hint or they'll even lay out the prediction with a fortune teller or by the characters just discussing how they feel like things are going to end up. But it's a red herring because that's not really how the author ends the story. So don't always think that if the author tells you something's going to happen, it's going to happen. But foreshadowing can often be a good textual support for any predictions you're going to make. So whenever you are making predictions while you're reading a story, make sure that your predictions are based on evidence either from the story itself, information in that text, or information that you've gained from reading other books and getting a general knowledge about literature. Theme. Theme is the overall idea of a piece of literature. So think about the lesson or moral of the story that the author is trying to get across to you. One thing to remember is do not confuse theme with plot. Plot is what the characters do. It's the action of the story. It does not have to do with the overall lesson or message that the author is getting across. Now obviously what the characters do is going to help you understand the theme, but plot and theme are not the same thing. Plot is going to be more about human nature, society, and life in general. There can also be more than one theme. The author may have one overall message, but there may be a few messages in there, or you may be able to find more than one theme besides the main controlling theme of the story. Some questions to ask yourself are, what is the lesson or message? And some common themes are, man struggles against society, man struggles against nature, overcoming adversity, the importance of family and friendship, 
man struggles with faith, sacrifices bring rewards, and honesty is the best policy. So for all of these, I want us to look at the story of the tortoise and the hare from Aesop's Fables. And this shows you that there can definitely be more than one theme for one story. Now, all of these may not be what Aesop had in mind when he was coming up with this fable, but I was able to see all of these themes in the story. The last one, I couldn't come up with something for, but I've got a good one for that as well. So, man struggles against society. You've got this tortoise who feels like he's going to keep going and he's going to try to win the race, but all of society is against him and saying, oh, that hare has got you beat. He's way faster than you. I don't know why you think you're fast enough to beat him. So I'm sure that tortoise was struggling against society's views of him. Another one would be man's struggle against nature. The tortoise is struggling against the nature of his self, how he's made. He's obviously not going to be as fast as the hare. Um, he's going to have to go up hills. He's going to be fighting against the very nature of his self where the hare is made to go much faster. Overcoming adversity. Just simply winning the race, the tortoise ended up winning even though no one expected him to do it. Even though people were probably telling him, oh, you can't do that. The hare is always going to beat you. The importance of family and friendship. Now, I've talked a lot about society, telling the tortoise he couldn't do this, but I'd like to think that the tortoise had some family and friends on his side that were urging him on, that helped him feel like he could actually go through and win this race. Man struggles with faith. The tortoise had to have faith in himself. The hare was very, very cocky. He felt like he had this race won so much so that he went and took a nap, where the tortoise didn't do that. He had faith in himself and knew that he could do this if he just kept going, if he gave it his all. And then sacrifices bring rewards. The tortoise sacrificed that nap that the hare took and in the end he won the race because he just kept going. Now the moral of the story they give you is slow and steady wins the race, but I can see all of these themes in that story. Now honesty is the best policy. I couldn't really come up with one for but you can always look at Pinocchio. Pinocchio, every time he told a lie, his nose grew. It was not a good thing. Every time he lied, something bad happened to him. I won't ruin the whole story for you, but everyone knows about the growing nose, which is a sad punishment for someone who is not using honesty. So it's showing you honesty is the best policy. So whenever you're reading a story, you can look at what the characters are doing to figure out what the plot is, but remember the theme is different. The theme is going to be the controlling idea in that piece of literature, and you want to ask yourself, what is the lesson or moral the author is trying to get across to me? Transitional words and phrases. Transitional words and phrases are used to guide the reader through the text. You've probably seen a lot of these common transitional words and phrases before, but you may not have thought about what their operation is, what their purpose is in the paper. So let's look at the different ways transitions can be used. You can have transitions that show time information. For instance, after, before, during, in the middle of. These all tell you when in time something is happening. You can also have transitions that indicate an example is about to be given. For example, in fact, for instance, if you say something, if you state your main idea and then you want to give a supporting example, you can say, in fact, let me tell you this thing. For example, dogs make good pets because they are very loyal. These phrases let you know that an example is coming. Transitions can be used for comparing. Also, likewise, you're saying how two things are alike. This is also like this. Likewise, we can look at how dogs are good companions. You can also use them for contrasting, saying how two things are different. 
However, but, yet, you would like a dog for a pet because they are so companionable, but a cat is not going to be as affectionate. They won't make as good of a companion as a dog. So you can contrast two things using however, but, yet. Transitions can be used to suggest addition to let you know that more is coming. And also, furthermore, these all let you know more is coming. More examples are coming, more information is coming, more details of the same sort. You can have transitions that reflect logical relationships. If, then, therefore, as a result, since, if I go to bed late, I might be tired in the morning. I went to bed late, therefore, I was tired in the morning. So these transitions reflect logical relationships. And our last example for transitional words and phrases are steps in a process. And these words show that uh, exactly. They're showing steps in a process. First, you'll gather up all your ingredients. Second, you'll mix the dry ingredients in a bowl. Last, you'll take the cake out of the oven. So these steps are telling you exactly what's happening first, second, third. They may throw in next, after that. They may not want to just put numbered all the time. Like last isn't telling you the tenth step. It just uses the transitional word last. But it still is giving you an idea of what step that is in a process. So, make sure you use your transitional words and phrases where they will orient your reader and illuminate the structure of your composition. You want to let your readers know where they are in your paper. If you're saying, first, this happens, next, this happens, or if it steps in a process, first, you do this. Second, you do this. Or if you're comparing and contrasting things, you would say, well, here's this. Likewise, there's this. However, there's this if you're contrasting. And you want to illuminate the structure of your composition. If you're writing a compare and contrast essay, these compare and contrast transitional words are going to help highlight that that's what type of essay you're writing. If you're writing a persuasive essay, you might see a lot of examples. If you're writing an instructional essay, you'll see a lot of steps in a process. If you're writing an informational essay, you may have some logical relationships. So using these transitional words and phrases can help let your reader know what the purpose of your writing was. So please always include transitional words and phrases in your writing because you want to guide your reader through the text and let them know what your purpose is. Transitions are very helpful to the reader because they help the reader transition from one thought to another or one concept to another. Transitions can be placed at the beginning of a sentence or in the middle of a sentence, either to help the reader transition from one sentence to another or from one part of the sentence to another part of the sentence. So I want to take a look at many different kinds of transition words and phrases that can be used and how they can be used accurately in sentences. So first of all, transitions can be broken up into different kinds of transitions. So some transitions show addition, like the transitions next and in addition. Remember I said that we can also have transition phrases, and so this is a prepositional phrase acting as a transition. Another type of transition is a summary, like in conclusion or finally. And there are some transitions that show sequence, like later or then. And then finally, some transitions show contrasts, like although or meanwhile. So how can you effectively use these transitions in sentences? Many times the transition word or transition phrase needs to go at the beginning of the sentence. Like here, this sentence says, next, bake the cookies for 10 minutes. So we put the transition at the beginning of the sentence and put a comma after it. Now, generally, commas come in pairs in sentences when they are showing that a certain part of the sentence isn't needed. So notice here that next could be removed from the sentence, and we could just read the sentence like this. Bake the cookies for 10 minutes, and it would still make sense. 
So usually when you have some kind of phrase or word that can be omitted from the sentence, you put commas on both sides of it. Like here's part of a sentence, then there's a comma, here's the part of the sentence that isn't needed, another comma, and then the rest of the sentence. But when a word or phrase comes at the beginning or the end of a sentence, you only need one comma because you wouldn't put a comma before next. That would look funny. So you just put a comma after it to show that next isn't there. So although next isn't essential to the sentence, it's helpful because it helps the reader understand the transition from one thought to another. In this case, the next step and directions on how to bake cookies. All right, this next sentence says, although I enjoy the outdoors, I do not like to run. Although is a transition that shows contrast. And notice here there's not a comma right after although. It's placed after outdoors. But again, although I enjoy the outdoors could be removed from the sentence, and it would still make sense. It would just say, I do not like to run. Nevertheless, this part of the sentence is still important to the overall paper. Now, notice that in certain cases, you have to continue the sentence for it to make sense. Like here, it wouldn't matter um, whether next was here or not. But since you put although right here, you have to finish the sentence. You couldn't say, although I enjoy the outdoors. Because I enjoy the outdoors makes sense by itself, but once you add although to it, you're telling the reader that there's something else that needs to come. So after you put although I enjoy the outdoors, you have to put I do not like to run to finish out the sentence. So the things that are important to remember from this session is that there are many different kinds of transitions that can be classified into different categories. And there's many more categories we could have listed and many more transitions we could have listed under each category. And then generally, the transition word or phrase is going to go at the beginning of the sentence. And in this case, where there's a phrase at the beginning of the sentence that is started off by a transition word, make sure you finish the sentence and don't leave the reader hanging by writing a fragment. We could place the term false analogy into a group called a logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And so as a reader, it is important to recognize logical fallacies because they diminish the value of the author's message. So like I said, a false analogy is a logical fallacy. And so we could also call a false analogy a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, it is when the author suggests that two things are similar when in fact they are different. So basically a false analogy is a false comparison. So many times an author uses a false analogy when they're trying to convince the reader that something unknown is like something familiar. So the author is taking something unknown to the reader and comparing it to something familiar. Now, here the author is taking advantage of the reader's ignorance. Because like I said, this is comparing something unknown with something familiar. So the reader is not familiar with this unknown thing that we're talking about. So because of that, the author is able to take advantage of the reader's ignorance. So an example of a false analogy would be this statement right here. Failing to tip a waitress is like stealing money out of somebody's wallet. Now, of course, failing to tip is very rude, especially when the service has been good. But people are not arrested for failing to tip as they would be for stealing money from a wallet. So to compare stingy diners with thieves is a false analogy. False dichotomy is an example of a logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And that's just what false dichotomy is, a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we can define false dichotomy as when the author creates an artificial sense that there are only two possible alternatives in a situation. And by doing that, the author limits both the reader's options and imagination. And so this fallacy is common 
when the author has an agenda and wants to give the impression that their view is the only sensible one. And so readers should always be suspicious of the false dichotomy. When an author limits alternatives, the reader must ask, is the author being valid? Now, an example of false dichotomy is, you need to go to the party with me, otherwise you'll just be bored at home. And so here, the speaker suggests that the only other possibility besides being at the party is being bored at home. This is not true, as it is perfectly possible to be entertained at home, or even to go somewhere other than the party. And so this is an example of false dichotomy, because here the author is creating that artificial sense that there are only two possible alternatives. One is to go to the party, and one is to be bored at home. And remember that I said the author wants to give the impression that their view is the only sensible one. And so here, the only sensible option looks like to go to the party because who wants to be bored at home? Whereas really, there's many options and there's many sensible options in this situation. So that's why this is an example of false dichotomy. An overgeneralization is a type of logical fallacy, which is a failure of reasoning. And so that is what an overgeneralization is, a failure of reasoning. But more specifically, we could define it as when an author makes a claim that is so broad it cannot be proved or disproved. So when an author uses an overgeneralization, it's usually to accomplish one of two motives. The first is to create an illusion of authority. So the author may want to make it look like they have authority when in fact they do not. The second possible motive is to sway the opinion of the reader. Usually um, this would be accomplished by using sensational language. And so if the author was writing a persuasive essay, he may employ the use of overgeneralization to sway the opinion of the reader. Now, take a look at this example right here of overgeneralization. Everybody knows she is a terrible teacher. Now, here the author makes an assumption that cannot really be believed. It may be that most people do indeed have a negative view of the teacher, but to say that everybody feels that way is an exaggeration. Here, the author is claiming consensus when none actually exist. Now, when a reader spots an overgeneralization like this one, they should become skeptical about the argument that is being made because an author will often try to hide a weak or unsupported assertion behind authoritative language. So if you see a statement like this and you can recognize it as an overgeneralization, know that that means that the author is probably trying to hide a weak or unsupported assertion behind authoritative language. A technical passage is a piece of writing used to describe a complex object or process. So that's the main point of a technical passage, to describe a complex object or process. Because of that, a technical passage is always going to be nonfiction. Many times technical passages will relate to something in the medical or technological fields. I'm just going to abbreviate technological. So technical passages could be about many different types of fields, but generally things in the medical and technical fields are complex, so that's why a lot of technical passages will relate to those fields. So the goal of an author when writing a technical passage is to state everything simply and clearly. In order to accomplish that goal, the author has several tactics it will often use to state everything simply and clearly. The first is by putting everything in a logical order. The second tactic is to use subheadings. 
and headings. And the third tactic is to use letters and numbers. That sounds very vague, but, uh, but what I'm talking about here is by numbering the main points or using letters to separate sections of the paper. And because of uh, using lots of subheadings and headings and letters and numbers, oftentimes a passage will appear more like an outline than an actual piece of writing. But nevertheless, that's fine because the goal of the writer here is to describe the complex object or process simply and clearly. So that's the important thing to pay attention to there. So just to review, a technical passage is for the purpose of describing a complex object or process. And everything needs to be stated simply and clearly. So the three tactics an author can use are logical order, subheadings and headings, and letters and numbers. A bias is basically when an author is unfair or inaccurate in his or her presentation of something. In their attempt to persuade, writers often make mistakes in their thinking patterns and writing choices. This is because every author has a point of view. And that's important to remember. Every author has a point of view. Which is basically just the way they look at something, the way they see a certain situation. So because they have this point of view, naturally in their writing, they oftentimes will show their point of view through their writing. And so that's when a bias comes into play. So it's not necessarily bad for an author to have a point of view. They're just naturally going to have one. But it is a problem when they start to include it in their writing. So that's when a bias comes into play. And so a bias is when someone ignores reasonable counter-arguments or distorts opposing viewpoints. So you as a reader need to be aware when an author is being biased. So look for any clues like when they only talk about their own arguments for something and don't talk about any opposing ideas. Or when you are aware of another viewpoint and they share the viewpoint but they don't share it exactly correct. So be aware of those types of things and then once you are tipped off once that a writer is being biased, you will know that other times they, when they present opinions that those opinions may also be biased. Characters are an essential part of every story, so characters can be classified into two main categories, flat and round. The terms flat and round pertain to how much the character changes throughout the story. So flat characters have little change in personality throughout the story, or many times no change in personality. They're very predictable, they're always the same. And because they're predictable, they can be considered not very interesting. So that's why they play small roles in the story. The main characters of a story are never going to be flat characters. Instead, they're going to be round characters because round characters incur lots of change throughout the course of a story. So they play the main roles. So flat characters and round characters both contribute a lot to a story. Obviously, round characters are needed to play the main roles because they're going to be developing and changing a lot and that's what moves the plot along. The plot is moved along by changes in characters' personalities. Flat characters are also needed, however, because they play the smaller roles in the story, the supporting roles that make the main characters very interesting. So when we're talking about round characters, you probably heard me use the word development. And that's what authors try to do with round characters. They try to develop the characters, and it's the development of the characters that moves the plot along. If the characters stay the same, the characters stay the same throughout the entire story, then the plot's not very interesting because the plot's not going to progress very much. So round characters are essential to moving the plot along. But the important thing to take away from this, if you remember one thing, is that characters can be split up into flat characters and round characters. Flat characters having the same personality and round characters changing in personality throughout the story. Many times, the definition of a word can be determined by um, looking at it in context. Now, generally, this can be a pretty easy task by just looking at words around that word to figure out the context meaning. Now, sometimes words are much harder to, to determine the meaning of. So I want to go over a couple of those cases. 
Take this sentence for example. Frank's admonition rang in her ears as she climbed the mountain. Now say you have no idea what admonition means. The best thing to do is substitution. Take other words that you think would fit in this sentence and see if they make sense. So the words vow, promise, advice, complaint, or compliment all make sense in this sentence. Like you could substitute advice for admonition. Frank's advice rang in her ears or Frank's compliment rang in her ears. So although these words all fit in this sentence, they all have somewhat similar but really different meanings. But the main thing you need to realize here is that admonition must mean message because these are all types of messages or something he spoke to her. So the important thing you're realizing from this is that it's Frank's message ringing in her ears as she climbed the mountain. Substitution is rarely able to pinpoint the exact meaning of a word, but it can give you a general idea of what the word means. Another example of words that are hard to determine the meaning of in context are words that have multiple meanings. So I take the word cleave, for example. It can mean join or separate, which are total opposites. So how do you determine w um, when the word means what? Well, the best thing to do, again, is substitution. You have two meanings here, join or separate. So you, every time you see cleave in a sentence, you can uh, substitute the word cleave for join or separate and see which one makes sense. So this sentence says the birds cleave together as they flew from the oak tree. Well, if we use the word join, it says the birds join together as they flew from the oak tree. But if you put the birds separated together as they flew from the oak tree, that wouldn't make sense. The reason being is because of the word together. Together means joined or near each other. So join must be the meaning of cleave in this sentence. This next sentence says Jim's knife cleaved, cleaved the bread cleanly. So if we use the word joined, it really wouldn't make sense because why would you use a knife to join something? Everyone knows that a knife is used to cut something. So because of knife, we know that in this case, cleaved means separated. So those are some examples of how to use substitution to determine the meaning of a word. The text used to support an argument must be credible, or another word for credible would be believable. And it's important for writers to be credible so that the re reader will believe their writing. So there's a couple of important things that an author should do in order to be credible. First, they need to be knowledgeable on the subject. And second, they need to be unbiased. So when we talk about being knowledgeable, I'm saying that the writer needs to understand what they are writing about. Consider if you were looking at two reports about the ozone layer. One was written by an environmental scientist and the other by a hairdresser. You are more likely to believe the report written by the environmental scientist than the report about the ozone layer by the hairdresser. Why? Because the environmental scientist knows more about the ozone layer, or at least you believe that they do. So that's why it's important to be knowledgeable in order to be believable. And the second important trait is to be unbiased. And that means the author doesn't need to have a special agenda at hand. They need to present all viewpoints equally and fairly instead of casting one viewpoint in a negative light or um, casting another viewpoint in a positive light. So those are the two most important traits in order to be credible or believable. And or, in order to decide uh, whether an author is credible, you need to look at their motivations. In other words, you need to know why they are writing the paper. If it's to persuade the reader, then you know they are not going to be very credible because they may skew certain facts to try to persuade you. But if they're just presenting information, just for the purpose of presenting information to the reader, then they are most likely credible. Almost any type of writing is descriptive, and then it seeks to describe a certain person, place, thing, or idea. But a descriptive text is more specific, and then it takes one particular subject and then tries to depict that clearly to the reader. So we could say that a descriptive text focuses on one subject. So it focuses on one subject and then tries to depict that subject clearly to the reader. And when you think of describing something, that means using lots of adjectives and adverbs, lots of descriptive words. So 
as you can imagine, a descriptive text is going to have lots of adjectives and adverbs. So I'm just going to abbreviate adjective and adverb. So when you think about a descriptive text, that means it's going to include details. So you want lots of details in a descriptive text. That's what the writer is going for. So over here you have too many details. Because even though you're trying to, the writer is trying to include lots of details, there can be too many. But on the other end of the spectrum over here, if there's not enough details, the paper can be vague or unclear. So what the writer is trying to accomplish here is a happy medium, somewhere in the middle, where the paper is not vague or unclear. It, it's very clear and very precise, but there's not so many details that the reader gets bogged down in all of the extra information. So as a writer, um, you should look to try to go in the middle in a descriptive text. And if you're reading something, you want to read things that are descriptive where the writer has a good balance of details in the paper. The purpose of an expository passage is to enlighten and inform the reader. But to state it more simply, the purpose of an expository passage is to teach. Because the purpose of this type of passage is to teach, everything here is going to be accurate. So that's why it's always going to be in a nonfiction passage. The topic of a passage of this type is always going to be very simple. It's going to be a simple topic. It's also going to be a very easily defined topic because the writer of a type, one of these types of passages wants the reader to be able to understand what they are saying very easily because they're trying to teach them something. So it's going to be, everything's going to be very simply stated so that the reader can understand what the writer is saying. Oftentimes, expository passages will contain words like first, next, for example, or therefore. The reason these types of words would be used is because the reader, or excuse me, the writer is going to make a point that talks about the topic and then back things up uh, with certain details. So in other words, the writer is going to state a fact and then back it up with details. So he might say, this is because first, second, and finally, or next we're going to talk about this argument for our topic. Or he might give a certain example about a topic and then say, for example, or because of this, therefore. Everything is revolved around teaching. So any words like this or any other words that may go along with teaching something are going to be used in these types of situations. So the important thing to remember is that an expository passage is meant for teaching and it's going to be nonfiction. Authors will oftentimes try to express feelings. So it's important that you as a reader recognize when an author is trying to express feelings. So first of all, let's take a look at some situations in which a writer may express their feelings. It may be when they're giving a personal story or telling about a personal situation. And personal situations are, like it sounds, very personal to them. It pertains directly to them. It's something they've experienced. So strong emotion will come out of that and they're going to express their feelings. Often if a writer is trying to persuade someone, then there will also be strong feelings as the writer is trying to arouse the emotions of the reader to get them to think a certain way or to take a certain action. You can know that a writer is trying to express feelings when they use phrases like, I felt, or I sense. Here, the writer is inserting their own opinions. They're not giving facts. They're talking about their own opinions, and here they're going to be talking about feelings because feeling something, like it says, I felt, so that's a feeling, or I sense something, that's also a feeling. So those kind of phrases can tip you off that some kind of personal emotion or personal feeling is coming. It's important that you recognize these strong emotions. 
recognize when strong emotions are portrayed or when certain feelings are expressed. Because you as the reader don't want to fall into the trap of giving too much sympathy to the writer. Because if you fall into the trap of falling into all the emotions of the writer, then it's going to be hard for you to look at the text objectively and try to understand the text better and to evaluate it. So you need to kind of distance yourself from the emotions of the writer so that you can evaluate what you are reading. So the important thing to remember is that an author will express feelings when talking about a personal situation or when they are trying to persuade. And it's important that you as the reader recognize these strong feelings. A great way to organize ideas from a text is by using a graphic organizer. And a graphic organizer is basically a way to simplify information and just take the key points from the text. So you can see why this would be helpful for a reader, because it helps the reader determine the main points and see how the main points are connected to other main points. So one type of graphic organizer is the timeline. And this helps the reader determine the main points and then determine chronologically when those main points took place, because you're going to have a line here, you have different points, and so main points are going to go under these vertical lines here along the horizontal line depending on uh, when they took place for second or last. Another great form of, of, graphic, of a graphic organizer is the outline because here the reader is determining main points and then the sub points that go along with those main points. So it helps the reader determine what is most important and what is second or what is secondly important. The spider map is also a great resource. Here the, the reader takes a circle and puts the main point inside of the circle and then draws legs off of this web here, or off this circle to make a web. And then at the end of each point is another main point. And then main points can even branch off of these. Um, so really what you have here is you have the, the main point or maybe the thesis of the whole paper. Then you have the main points coming off of that thesis. And then you might even have sub points coming off of those main points. Then there also is the Venn diagram. And this is helpful in determining main points and seeing how the main points of the passage are connected to others. Because you may have some circles like this. And so here you have a main point inside of each circle. And so you can see how some main points are connected and overlapping with another main point, And then some main points are overlapping with two other main points. And so it helps the reader determine the main points and helps them to determine how the main points are connected with the other main points. Every piece of writing should have a logical conclusion, and it's your job as the reader to identify that conclusion, mainly for the purpose of helping you to understand whether you agree with the writer or not. Because you don't want to just read a piece of literature, you want to analyze it. So one step in that process to better understanding it is identifying the conclusion to know whether you agree with the writer or not. So now I want to talk about how to identify that conclusion. So you're going to need to infer a lot or make an inference. And to infer something just means to take what you already know and combine it with something else to draw a conclusion. So it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. And so what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to combine two things. What you already know with the info or the information found in the text. So I'm going to draw a double arrow there because to make an inference, you're pulling these two things together, everything you find in the text, and you pre-knowledge you have, and you're pulling that together to draw the conclusion. And generally, a conclusion should be obvious. If a writer does a good job in their writing, then the conclusion should be easily identifiable. Otherwise, you may draw a conclusion that is not the conclusion the writer had in mind. But nevertheless, it's important that you as the reader analyze the writing and identify the logical conclusion. Irony is a statement that suggests its opposite. Look at this example. A man walks in his home covered in mud and in tattered clothes. 
His wife says, how was your day? And the man replies, great. This is an example of irony, because obviously the husband did not have a great day. He went through some kind of major conflict where he now is covered in mud and has tattered clothes, but he still says his day was great. So this is irony, because irony is when the literal meaning is different than the intended meaning. Here, the literal meaning of what the husband said is that he had a great day. But the intended meaning is to say, I actually had a terrible day, and that's why he's saying great, because this is an example of irony. Now, you may think this, that this is sarcasm, but irony is different than sarcasm. Like I said, irony is a statement in which the literal meaning is opposite from the intended meaning. Sarcasm is also a statement in which the literal meaning is opposite from the intended meaning, but it's also meant to be insulting to the person at whom it is directed. A sarcastic statement suggests that the other person is stupid enough to believe an obviously false statement is true. Irony is a bit more subtle than sarcasm. A metaphor is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing with that of something else. This sentence says, the bird was an arrow arcing through the sky. Now here, the bird wasn't actually an arrow, but instead the author is saying the bird is like an arrow arcing through the sky. This is a way for the author to get to think about the bird in a different way and to equate it with an arrow and an arrow making an arc through the sky. This is a way for the author to describe the bird in more detail without being direct and obvious because the author could say the bird swiftly flew through the air and bent through the air making a big arc. But that's not very interesting. That doesn't evoke emotion on the part of the reader. So instead, in this case, the author chose to use a metaphor saying the bird was like an arrow arcing through the sky. And because of that, the reader can conclude that the bird must have flown swiftly and then bent through the sky, maybe going up and then coming back down. Now, sometimes authors use metaphors, but they don't directly tell you what they're talking about. Here, we knew that the author was talking about a bird. But look at this sentence. Swaying skeletons reached for the sky and groaned as the wind blew through them. Here, we don't know exactly what the author is talking about, but we can uh, infer that the author is talking about trees because it would make sense that trees would sway back and forth and that maybe at this point it's in the winter and the, the trees don't have any limbs, so it's just like the skeleton of a tree and it's swaying back and forth. So that would make sense here, and so sometimes it's a little bit difficult to figure out exactly what the author is talking about. In this case, it wasn't, but nevertheless, this is another example of a metaphor where the author is comparing the trees to skeletons, and that allows the reader to look at the trees in a different perspective. Now we're thinking about trees as big skeletons swaying back and forth and groaning. And so that's a way for the author to give us a different perspective about these trees without being real direct and obvious. So just to review, a metaphor is, when the, is a type of figurative language in which the author equates one thing to that of something else. A narrative is basically a piece of writing that is a story. So I'm going to write that up here on the board, because that's important to remember, that a narrative is a story. Now, notice in the word narrative that it kind of sounds like the word narrator or narration. Now, when you think of a narrator, it's generally the person in a play that guides the audience through the story and tells what's going on. So in the same way, a narrative, a narrative is basically telling the reader a chain of events. So it gets the story, and then it can be nonfiction or fiction, as long as it is a story. Now, there are certain characteristics that a piece of writing must have in order to be considered a narrative. First of all, it must have a plot. A plot is basically the meat of the story. It uh, starts out with the problem that arises in the story, and then how the characters try to overcome that problem, and then finally ends with the characters overcoming the problem. So I know you notice that I talked about the characters doing things in the plot. So that's the second thing that a narrative must have, characters. These characters can be people, animals, or things. But generally, it's going to be people. There has to be some kind of interaction between the characters in order to form the plot, which forms the narrative. And then finally, a narrative is going to include figurative language. Figurative language is basically something that's not totally true. 
Like think of a metaphor, which is a type of figurative language. Like if I were to say, the moon was a frosty snowball. Look at that sentence. The moon was a frosty snowball. So notice here the moon wasn't actually a frosty snowball, but basically the writer is saying the moon looked like a frosty snowball. So that's an example of figurative language because this is an example of a metaphor. So any kind of narrative is going to include sentences like this one that leave um, some things up to the reader's imagination. So the important thing to remember about a narrative is that it tells a story. Sometimes after reading a passage, it can be helpful to write an outline. And outlining is helpful because it aids in the drawing of conclusions. So overall, um, an outline should accomplish two things. It should reveal the structure of the passage. And two, like I said earlier, it should lead to solid conclusions. There are many ways uh, to structure an outline, but I want to go over one approach that works very well, and that's to first to have a title, which is basically the main idea of the whole passage, though you don't have to write it word for word. And then you have main ideas under Roman numerals. So these are your big general ideas. You're not getting very specific yet. Then under your main ideas, you have supporting ideas and details. Throughout the passage, there are sure to be many details. And so when I talk about including details here, you don't need to include every detail. Just include details that are central to the argument or message. So remember, like I said, outlines are helpful because they aid in drawing conclusions and they reveal the structure of the passage. So remember to draw an outline or make an outline after you read a passage that you cannot find the conclusion of. A pie chart is very helpful for showing how a certain category is divided. So see here we have the makings of a pie chart, but it's still missing a lot. Right now all we have is information that we need to plug into this pie chart. So right here we have the expenses of Joe. So rent is $200, food is $100, gas is $50, and entertainment is $50. And this is per month. So first we need a title for this pie chart. So the title is going to be Joe's Monthly expenses. So the great thing about a title is it allows the reader of the graph to quickly look at this graph, see the title, and know what this pie chart is going to pertain to. So now we first need to realize or understand how much money total, total is being spent. So here is $400 total. 200 plus 100 plus 50 plus 50 is 400. So we see here rent is $200. So if rent is 200 then we can reduce this down to 2 over 1, or flip it over. So here we realize, but the important thing is that you realize that 200 is one half of 400. So if we draw a line right here, we realize that rent is half, or 50% of all of Joe's expenses. Well, food is $100, so that's a quarter of it. And then gas and entertainment are 50 each. So this half right here represents 200 and this quarter represents 100, then $50 should represent half of a quarter or an eighth of the total expenses. So we'll put gas here and entertainment, which I'll just abbreviate. So now you can clearly look at this pie chart and understand how the expenses are, are split up. Because over here you have money amounts and that's important because someone may want to know, okay, how much is this person spending on gas? They can look, okay, $50. But what's great about this right here is it helps the, the reader 
get a visual understanding of this information up here. It helps them understand in their mind what percentage of the, of the person's income is being spent on what. And so someone can easily see here, okay, they're spending less money on gas than they are on food, and they're spending the same amount of money that they are on gas as entertainment, and they're spending twice as much money on rent as they are on food. So it provides a very visual representation. So when making a pie chart, it's important that the writer title it, and they also need to understand what percentage of the whole each thing represents. So here someone needs to see, okay, entertainment, $50, and the total expenses are $400, and realize that 50 is one-eighth of that. So um, entertainment can only be one-eighth of this circle right here because if it was a bigger area of the circle, then it would be disproportional and it wouldn't um, clearly convey to the reader. So the important thing here to remember is that a pie chart is a visual way to show how a category is divided up. A prediction is a guess about what will happen next. So when a reader actively engages in whatever they are reading, they naturally make predictions about what will happen next. And they base these predictions off of what they have read, and what they already know. So by taking what they have read and what they already know, a reader can formulate what they think will happen next in the story. So consider this sentence. Staring at the computer screen in shock, Kim blindly reached over for the brimming glass of water on the shelf to her side. So the reader is naturally going to read this and have an idea of what is going to happen next. And the reader will probably notice the word blindly. So Kim is so caught up in what's happening on the computer she goes for a drink of water, but since she's caught up on what's go going on on the computer, she reaches over without really looking at the glass of water to grab it. So the reader is going to assume that she's going to knock over the glass of water. Now, that may not be what happens, but still it's a prediction either way. The prediction may come true, and a prediction may not come true. But a reader is naturally going to make predictions about a passage, and it's, uh, making predictions is part of being actively engaged in what the reader is reading. The purpose of an author is basically why the writer wrote the paper. It's what motivated them to write something. So there's three basic types of motivations or purposes of an author. They either wrote something to inform, entertain, or persuade. So it's important as a reader to understand the purpose of the author because it helps you better understand the text. So generally, it's pretty easy to determine what type of paper something is. So an informative paper is basically when the reader or the writer is just giving the reader facts about something. They're telling them more about something. A paper that is meant to entertain is generally fiction. It's uh, pretty much any kind of fiction work is meant to entertain. Now occasionally fiction will serve a double purpose of also trying to inform, trying to persuade. But generally um, when something's meant to entertain generally means that it's some kind of fiction piece. Then finally, the third type, or the third purpose, is to persuade. And this is actually the hardest type to determine, because generally, an author is going to try to hide that they're trying to persuade you. Because when someone knows they're trying to be persuaded, they're going to be wary or skeptical of the arguments that the writer is throwing at them. So a lot of times, a writer will try to disguise their persuasive paper as a paper that's meant to inform or a paper that's meant to entertain, but actually it's meant to persuade the reader. So those are the three main types of purposes of an author, to inform, to entertain, or to persuade. A sequence is the order in which things happen. So it's important that a reader be able to identify the sequence so they can follow along with what is happening in the passage. So a sequence is basically the order in which things happen, or the order of events. To help spot the sequence in a passage, you can look for words like first, then, 
last, and next. So if you find these words in a passage or other words like it, you'll know that that's showing you some part of the sequence. And so that helps you determine what happened first, then next, and then last. And finally, most sequences will be in chronological order. Basically, chronological means uh, based on time. So if I was talking about my day, I would say, okay, at 7 o'clock I got up, at 7.30 I ate breakfast, at 8 o'clock I went for a run, and then at 12 o'clock I ate lunch. See, that's chronological. It's proceeding through time. Now, some text might not be in chronological order, and so those can be more confusing when trying to find the sequence. However, sometimes that's the best way to go about writing certain passages. So just understand that not all passages will be in chronological order, but nevertheless, it's important that you understand the sequence of events. So to practice, take a look at this sentence. He walked in the front door and switched on the hall lamp. Notice here that none of these words are present in this passage. However, you can still find what the sequence is here. So you know that he must have walked in the front door first and then switched on the light bulb. That had to have happen second because first he had to get inside the door. So this may seem like a very simple and elementary example, but it's still important to be able to identify the sequence in a passage or sentence. A stereotype is basically a bias against a specific group of people or a specific place. So you as a reader need to be attentive to when someone is using a stereotype. So like I said, a stereotype is a bias against a specific group or place. And stereotypes are generally a generalization. And a generalization is basically where you look at a specific group of people and you take what is true for some of the people and apply it to everyone. Like, take for example, if I said everyone in Nebraska is a corn farmer. Now, there are many corn farmers in Nebraska, but not everyone there is a corn farmer. So I took what was true for a few people and applied it to everyone in Nebraska. So that's a mild case of a stereotype because most stereotypes are negative. You may have heard some negative stereotypes towards specific cultures, ethnicities, and religions. So anytime you as a reader notice a stereotype, recognize that that means the author is ignorant and not curious. In other words, they may not be willing to look into the details. They see something that they think is true and so then they state it as fact. So that's why I say they're not very curious. And they're also ignorant because they may be aware that they are using a stereotype, but they may not care. And so they're ignorant about that, which means they're also going to be ignorant about other things. So as a reader, be attentive to when a writer is using stereotypes. Supporting details are very important parts of a paper. It can be said that the topic and main idea of a paper is the most important part, but without supporting details, main ideas and topics are irrelevant. So basically, supporting details reinforce a larger point. So a writer will make a point which may take the form of a topic or a main idea of a paper. So the writer makes that point and then the writer backs up their point with supporting details. And these details are most often found in informative and persuasive text. And this makes sense because if the writer is telling you about something, each main point they make, they're also going to need to back up with more points so that you, the reader can be sure that they are um, being told accurate information. Then also in a persuasive text, if the writer is trying to get the reader to do something or to think a certain way, the writer can't just make a bunch of points. They're going to have to back up those points so that the reader will indeed think that way or take that action that the writer wants them to take. And supporting details are often easy to spot because the writer will let you know that those details are coming. A lot of times they'll make a main point and then they'll say something like first and they'll make us um, give a supporting detail and second and give another supporting detail and then say finally and then give the third supporting detail. Or they might say something like for example or for instance and that would tip you off that the next supporting detail is coming along. 
supporting details need to be two things. They need to be both factual and relevant. Because if something is totally accurate and factual, but it's not relevant to the main idea, then it's no good. The supporting detail needs to be accurate and needs to uh, relate back to the main idea. And if a supporting detail is very relevant, if it pertains to the main idea, but it's not accurate, then again, it's no good because what good is information that is not true? So the important thing to remember with supporting details is that basically their job is to reinforce a larger point. And they can be most, most often found in informative and persuasive text. They're often easy to spot because they're preceded by words like first, second, and finally, or for instance, or for example. And the most important thing for details to be is both factual and relevant. The narrator plays an important role in the story, and it's important that you as a reader understand the narrator. So a narrator can talk in first person or in third person. In first person, the narrator will use pronouns like I and me because they're talking about things they're experiencing and things they see happening. And in this case, the narrator will actually be a character in the story, so it's important to understand which character they are playing. In third person, the pronouns he and she are used because the narrator is looking onto the situation saying he did this or she did this and so they're not a character in the story. So that's one thing you need to understand about the narrator. The second thing is how much how much does the narrator know? And you may be wondering why this is important. But some narrators are going to know what all the characters thoughts are and some narrators do not know that and some narrators will be able to explain to the reader what's going on and their thoughts about it and some narrators will just let the plot speak for itself. So how much the narrator knows influences how much the reader will know because however much the narrator knows they will then tell the reader that. So it's important to understand how much the narrator actually knows.